Hey everyone, and welcome to Faith. My name's Alyssa, and we are so glad that you've decided to join us today. You might be watching from your house or from a friend's house. You might be with others or by yourself, but however you're watching today, we are so grateful that you're here. We believe that even if you don't believe what we believe, or if you feel like your life is just way too messy to step foot in a church, you belong here. We are a community of broken people who are all on a journey towards Jesus. So you belong in the family. Today, we're continuing our series, The Being Challenge, and we'll hear from Pastor Doug in a moment. But before we dive in, would you do us a favor? We would love if you would share this video on social media. We believe that it was one of the best ways that we can spread the good news of Jesus across New England. So we would love it if you would share this message on Facebook. If you're new with us today, we wanna to welcome you to Faith Church. We are so glad that you're here. And to celebrate, we would love to pledge a $5 donation to a charity of your choice out of our pockets. All you have to do is text Faith Church to 97,000 and then follow the steps as a guest. Once you do that, we'll send you an email asking which charity you wish to donate to. And that's it. So again, take out your phone, you can do it right now, and text Faith Church to 97,000 and we'll pledge $5 on your behalf today. If you'd like to partner with us today and give, the best way to do that is to text Faith Church to 97,000 and you'll get a text reply back that will direct you from there. Our whole mission here at Faith is to love and lead people into a growing faith in Jesus. And it's because of your generosity that we're able to do that. So thank you for giving. With all that being said, our weekend experience is here and it starts right now. Hi, everybody. We are on the last Sunday of the Being Challenge, day 33. We've been asking ourselves the question, how do we grow in our relationship with God? And the simple answer is by implementing the habits of Jesus into our everyday lives. In other words, we become like Jesus when we do the things that Jesus did. And what habits do we see in Jesus? I kind of fear that in this COVID year, many of us have developed habits, perhaps some not so great. You see, a mistake repeated more than once is a habit. And it's not that many of us planned to do wrong. We just didn't have a plan to do what was right. In this series, we're attempting to replace some bad habits with some very good habits. And we've looked so far at the habits of Jesus in terms of community, scripture, prayer, and solitude. I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list. There are certainly other amazing ways to grow with God that we haven't covered, but most of us need to have a plan. And if you don't have a target to shoot for in your relationship with God, then it's going to go hard for you. So I suggest that you kind of pick up these habits and shoot for these. The last keystone habit of Jesus starts today. How many of you grew up in a home where you were, shall we say, forced to go to church? Or maybe the better word is coerced. Um, I remember I was 12 years old sitting in the back seat of our Dodge Aspen when I asked my stepbrother um, as we were driving away from church, whoever wants to be a minister must be crazy. Church is so boring. Little did I know then that I would be a minister myself and that the ministry would be anything but boring. I mean, I could tell you stories that would uh, curl your hair. My dad then spoke up from the front seat at that point, uh, and, and this was before he was a Christian, um, you, know, you know, he was going to church, a member of the church long before he was even a Christian, go figure. My dad said this, this was his logic. God gave you seven days a week, you can give him one hour. Have you ever heard that logic before? That's how my dad coerced us into going to church. See, my dad wasn't a Christian yet, but for him, church was kind of a, maybe a spiritual rotary club, a kind of co cosmic Kiwanis. You went to church, just walk through the door, do the Sunday morning thing, and then go about, go about your week, the rest of the week, doing your own thing. You simply do this. You go to church. It's what you do, just like maybe you do jail time or jury duty. Uh, that was the prevailing thought, the prevailing attitude in America. You go to church, whether you like it or not, young man. Now, may I say this? A lot has changed in the last couple of decades in terms of people's attitudes about church attendance, even 
among most self-proclaimed Christians. Did you know that 81% of Christians believe that you could be a good Christian without going to church? Uh, currently, only one in four Americans are practicing Christians as defined by Barna, as those who strongly agree that faith is very important in their lives and have attended church within the past month. In general, one third fewer Americans attend church weekly now than back in 1993, just a little under 30 years ago. People are less likely to attend church now than ever before. I mean, look at the graph and how the numbers just kind of track downward. And notice it's not just a phenomenon for one generation, but this applies to all generations, millennials, boomers, uh, you name it. And I wonder if the true numbers of church attendance today don't somehow align, maybe match up with the numbers of people who really attended, truly attended 30, 40, 50, maybe even 100 years ago. I, th I think we can all agree. It's very easy to be there and not really be there. To be present in body only, but not present in mind or in spirit. I know that that's how my dad saw it. As long as you just showed up, you got credit. You want me to pay attention to? Well, that's another thing altogether. Give me something that's worth being paid attention to. I love what Mark Twain wrote in his diary once. I went to church today and was not bored. <laughs> How very sad that is. How very unfortunate that for so many people, that's how they think of church. It's like having root canal or something. We associate it with boredom and, and drudgery and everything that's uh, just monotonous. Can I just say, that's not how it should be. That's not how Jesus pictured church to be. I mean, look at what Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. The Bible translation known as the message, I love it, quotes it like this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And this is the goal of being like Jesus, that these habits of Jesus would become the unforced rhythms of grace in our lives. That though they may be work at first and maybe even challenging or difficult, that over time these small habits just become a part of who we are and start to make a positive impact in our lives. I want to talk today about the positive impact of choosing church. The fifth keystone habit of Jesus. Remember, if we want to be like Jesus, we have to do the things that Jesus did. And Jesus most certainly spent time going to church, at least his version of church. But it was certainly much more than simply just going to church. In Luke 4, 16, as Jesus was starting out his public ministry, it states that he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. The word here, custom, athos, means tradition, or what he was used to doing, that which was his normal practice or routine. Now remember, this is before the church was even started, before the birth of the church at Pentecost. In Jesus' day, they were used to, had the custom of going to synagogue or the temple. The church today looks a little different than the synagogues of Jesus' day. However, the principle remains the same. Gathering together for mutual support and encouragement in order that we may go out and shine brighter out in the world. The church gathered, the church scattered. I mean, this was his practice this tradition, and it should be ours as well. It's a practice that has continued on for over two millennia. The Apostle Paul routinely did the very same thing that Jesus did. In Acts 17, 2, it reads like this, Paul went into the synagogue as was his custom. There it is again, that same word, ethos. Paul was a church planter and moved from city to city in town to town, planting churches. But as he went, the very first thing he would do was enter the synagogue, as was his custom. Very early on, the early church established this same exact pattern. The church gathered, the church scattered. In the book of Hebrews, the writer is writing to a group of believers, predominantly Jewish believers, who are 
under attack. They're considering leaving the faith of Christianity, belief in Christ, and going backwards, backwards into Judaism. And for nine chapters, the writer argues about the supremacy of Jesus and belief in him. But now in chapter 10, he turns the corner and begins to talk about the implications of that new life in Christ. See, Christianity always begins with the triumphant indicative, the announcement of God's grace, and not the imperative. We're not saved by what we do, but what has been done for us in Christ. The writer is in agreement with Paul and the rest of the New Testament that salvation is found in Jesus alone. And there are certain things that should automatically follow and flow from our new relationship in Christ. The writer pens a series of challenges, kind of let us statements that are all set in the plural tense, let us. Let's skip ahead to the last one that is pertinent for our discussion. Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25 says it like this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Now here's that word again, ethos, habit. That some had already fallen out of the habit of meeting together. All the way back in, the, in that day, that first church, at the ch church just starting out, there were already some who were neglecting the gathering together, the assembly, the fellowship of God's people. Now let's just take a guess here as to the reason for their disassociation. See, persecution was already beginning to poke its ugly head up out of the ground. I mean, it was getting tough for them. These Christians were between a rock and a hard place. They're beginning to feel the heat of being a Christian in an unfriendly world. And in the first century, everyone in the empire was required to offer uh, incense to Caesar and confess Caesar is Lord. And some cities took it even further than that. And if you didn't offer and you didn't confess, you were thrown to the lions. So this put Christians in a really tough spot because they could not and would not offer allegiance to anyone besides Jesus. Genuine believers would rather suffer than to give in to compromise. However, you can imagine many so-called Christians, so-called believers decided it was easier and less dangerous to simply walk away from the faith and return back to Judaism. You, you see, the book of Hebrews is a book written by a Hebrew to Hebrews, telling them not to be so Hebrew, but instead come back to Jesus. And here the writer is calling for commitment, not only to Jesus, but also to his body, the church, to consistently join together in order to encourage and support one another in the faith. See, there's power that comes from the consistent habit of being with the body of Christ, not just growing, not just going to church, but growing in church. See, spiritual drifting is infinitely dangerous. And being alone and being separated from other believers heightens the risk to drift. We need one another. We need to be near each other. I love what John Ortberg said once. He said that trying to grow spiritually without hearing the truth about yourself from somebody else is like trying to do brain surgery on yourself without a mirror. <laughs> the spiritual practice of gathering together is an ancient tradition that even predates Christianity. The ancient Israelites well understood the benefits of coming together for building up of one another, not just going, but growing. Way back in the Old Testament, the psalmist stated it so emphatically. He says it like this, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Yeah, see, there's a good metaphor for us, the body of Christ. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. When's the last time you heard someone use the word flourish in a sentence? Yeah, right? And then when's the last time you heard Jerry Remy talk about, uh, you know, uh, J.D. Martinez's hitting streak as flourishing? I mean, look at that, his batting average and how it's flourishing. Not so much, right? To flourish means to be growing, thriving, prospering, hard to kill. In Israel, where there's a lot of desert and not a lot of water, palm trees were a sign of plenty and abundance. The palm tree was the symbol of health. It's the life that triumphs over the harsh conditions of the wilderness. And when Jesus marched into Jerusalem on that day known as Palm Sunday, 
the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, it was the people that waved their palm branches as a sign of victory and that prosperity was on its way. And, and notice also what it says, they will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Cedars now are actually are an endangered species. They're protected now because for centuries, the whole scale logging of them was so prolific that they were nearly wiped out in Lebanon. Why were they so popular? The root word of cedar means literally strong or firm because that's what they are. They're known for durability, strength. Cedar, not just, not just that they smell nice, they're called the king of trees. The Phoenicians used them for enormous, their enormous uh, merchant ships, their fleet of ships. The cedars made them the first sea trading nation in the world. King Solomon of Israel procured cedar timbers to build the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, here's an interesting fact. Cedar trees can survive for three to five millennia. That's three to 5,000 years old. And here's what's really interesting. They grow up in the mountainous regions of Lebanon where the winds blow and howl and the storms rage. And the reason they can stand for so long, the reason for their longevity, their durability, is that they grow downward as much as they grow upward. Even better, their roots become intertwined with other, tre other trees. Some cedars develop their roots um, around uh, these, these uh, uh, some, some, some trees are three stories high, extending 100 feet 150 feet downward and outward parallel to the surface. In other words, these roots get intertwined with one another. The, the trees themselves, their roots are, are intertwined. They don't topple because they stand together. The roots are intertwined where nobody sees a support system that sustains and it holds the strength above the ground. That's what happens when we're rooted together and established in love. Same with us as believers. The righteous are like palm trees, cedars of Lebanon that grow under the worst circumstances and situations because they are what? They're planted in the house of the Lord and they will flourish. There's that word again, in the courts of our God. See, a seed can only grow if it's planted. Otherwise it stays dormant. Jesus taught a parable about seeds in Matthew 13. The sower casts out the seed and some of it falls on the hardened path where it can't plant itself and where the roots cannot go down deep into the soil. The birds come and simply snatch it away. The seed will never reach its potential there because it's not planted. Other seed falls on rocky soil and other seed falls on weedy soil. And there again, there's no chance for, for it to, to thrive because it's not rooted. Ah, but the other seed falls on the good soil and it gets planted there and it multiplies 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. One seed becomes a massive blessing because it's planted in good soil. One of the great characteristics of the early church was that no matter the challenges it faced, the amount of persecution it endured, even the threat of martyrdom, it never failed to meet together for corporate worship. Corporate worship was one of the essentials, one of, one of their core values. They may have not have had Wednesday night prayer meeting or VBS or Sunday school or even chili chowder cook-offs, all which are great things, but, but they always had corporate worship. Even if they had to go underground, that's where sometimes they went, down into the catacombs. Nothing ever got in the way of God's people gathering together to worship the Lord. That's why it's so strange for me to see people stay away from church now because they, well, maybe because they have to wear a mask or because, well, somebody's making them have to register to come to, to services on Sunday morning. The early Christians faced death in the arenas if it were found out that they were a member of the fellowship of Christ, but it didn't matter to them. They gathered anyway. See, you're a seed with much potential, but you can only flourish when you are planted in the house of the Lord, when you decide not just to go to church, but when you decide to grow in church. Seeds will lie dormant, dormant unfruitful. But when you're planted in the house of the Lord, you grow and they will bear fruit. What does it say? They will bear fruit in their old age 
and they will stay fresh and green. Their roots grow deep and outward, and consequently, they continually bear fruit in their life on into their senior years. These people aren't old curmudgeons. They're spiritual saints of God who keep on serving and shining forth the light of God in their lives. Like Jeremiah 17, 8 says about the person who trusts in the Lord, says he will be like a tree planted by the water that never fails to bear fruit. That's what growing Christians do throughout the course of their entire life. They keep on bearing fruit. And, and what's the fruit? Paul defines it so well for us in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of God being within, connected to the body of Christ, you will receive certain good things, attributes that flow from the Spirit of Christ, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Now, let's be very clear. A Christian is not just one who is saved from their sins, but someone who is saved for producing good works, fruit. I'm not saved by my good works, but I'm saved unto good works. God wants spiritual fruit, not religious nuts. Let me say this about our mission here. The mark of a healthy church is not how many people come, but in how many people live differently having come. That's what we aim to accomplish here. To be the place where believers are flourishing. We want to be a place where you don't just go to church, but you grow in church with God's people together with you into the likeness of Christ. And we do it together. Here's what I promise. You will suffer storms. You will experience dry times in your life and you will be attacked by harsh people. And if you aren't, you can have some of mine. You will feel the pressure of the enemy on your back. But wouldn't it be so much nicer not to have to suffer through this alone? If you face it alone, you're vulnerable. See, I don't think the devil minds at all you listening at home to church services in your comfy living room. You're not really a threat there. I don't think he even minds you going to church and counting the ceiling lights. Just as long as you're not growing in church. See, he wants, to, he wants to isolate you. It's the old divide and conquer method. If he can get you off by yourself, he's already won the battle in your life. You're never more vulnerable than when you are by yourself. The Bible unequivocally states that the predominant belief of even most Christians today is false. It's a myth. You can't be a good Christian apart from the body of Christ. You can be committed to the church and not committed to Christ, but you can't be committed to Christ and not committed to his church. It just simply doesn't work. You can't be a healthy, flourishing, maturing believer on your own. You need Christ and his church. It's a both and situation. We Christians are kind of like, can we put it this way? Short-lived radioactive isotopes. Remember back in chemistry class? Remember elements like hydrogen 7, for instance, which has a half-life of just a mere 23 seconds. Similarly, we believers have a very short spiritual half-life. Get us away from the worship of God and other saints, and our radioactivity diminishes and dissipates quickly, and we lose our effective radiance. Our light grows dim. We don't shine very bright and very long on our own. And the difficult circumstances of life only intensify the loss and the need to be re-energized. See, corporate worship, being planted in the house of the Lord, is the event in which we become radioactive for God. When we're not just, uh, when we're not in the collective worship with God's people, we've missed an exposure to God, and having missed it, we lose our radiance. When Jesus invites us to follow him. He invites us to not just go to church, but grow in church. And you've, you've stopped being comfortable. You need to stop being comfortable at home, watching whatever TV preacher you're watching, you know, Matt Chandler, or Charles Stanley, or even me, I, not that I'm in their camp at all. It's a temptation, isn't it, to live only through digital church, to be an online believer only and never again attend or come back to in-person worship services. 
Some of you may know the name uh, D. Martin Lloyd, Lloyd Jones. He was a tremendous preacher in the heart of London during World War II, uh, the 1950s, the 1960s. And for a long time, he refused to allow his sermons to be taped and even recorded, even though the technology existed. And what was the reason? His argument? He put it this way. Do you really think that if you're listening in your car or your home or the office, that it will have the same shaping impact and influence on you as if you're in the presence of other believers? So no. Worshiping, hearing the preaching in person, surrounded by other believers, affects who you are. And you become more in tune to the Holy Spirit. That is your whole person, your whole being is being affected and filled with the Spirit while you're with everyone else. Case in point, we've been on a zillion Zoom calls this year. We have all have to confess, don't we? It's not the same thing as being in the room with the person. You're so easily distracted. You're not present fully. It can't replace the real experience of being together. So I urge you, it's time to come back home, to be planted in the house of the Lord. That was the pattern of Jesus. It was the pattern of the early church. It was the pattern of ancient Israel. Stop going to church. Start growing in church. See, let me put it to you this way. I think there are two kinds of people out there. See, there's person A. This person goes to church or listens to church online and says, I did my time. I get uplifted, you know, I get buzzed when the preacher preaches and... I get all goosebumply when the singers sing, but there's no real connection. They never take on the mission of the church. They never become a true disciple of Jesus. There's no serving. There's no attending a small group. Their marriage suffers. The kids are on drugs. They're in debt way beyond their means. They live paycheck to paycheck and they hate their job. <laughs> they're perhaps saved, but they're not flourishing. So then there's person B. They go to church and maybe they made a church, the decision in church to follow Jesus, but then something began to percolate inside of them. They continued not just to go to church, but they started to get planted in church and growing in church, really connecting with God in the worship services, developing relationships with God's people and where there's real accountability, real prayer for one another, starting to use their spiritual gifts in some particular service or ministry. They're in a small group. They're flourishing. Church is not a place they go, but an identity, identity that they embrace. When the storms come, and they will, they're immovable because their roots go deep. Now, I know today that maybe some of my words were a little bit um, edgy for some of you. Perhaps it stung a little, but let me give you just a short little illustration here before I close today's message. I, I've had a pool now in my backyard for years now. I've become quite the um, pool aficionado, expert in pool maintenance. One thing I know is this, periodically, Pools need to get shocked, doused with an overabundance of chlorine to kill all the bacteria, all the germs. Why? Because two out of three Americans admit to doing this in the pool. You guessed it. I don't have to tell you what it is. And shocking the pool is necessary to get the pool back to the place where it needs to be. I believe that this is a beautiful image of what happens on Sunday morning. If we're really living on mission, doing what Jesus calls us to do, we're getting out there in the world. And this world, as amazing as it is, also brings a certain amount of brokenness and darkness into our lives. We're bombarded, surrounded. And, and, and we're surrounded by the bad news that gets funneled into our lives. The more I get out there in the world, the greater the tendency I have to get contaminated pick up some things in this world that maybe shouldn't be. My, my body, my system, my brain, it needs a shock. It, it needs a consistent place where it can go to hear the good news, to shock the system back into a right balance. Side note, if you know someone in the midst of this crazy season that we're in who has stopped attending, who needs a, a little shock in their life, a little nudge, don't, don't just sit back. Let's encourage them. Let's get them back. Let's go on the offense. Let's go find them. 2020 has been a crazy year, for sure. And 2021 kind of follows. So much has happened. It's be a temptation for so many to just walk away. So, 
So let's get them back. Why don't you come back? Come back home. Let's get planted back in the house of the Lord. And let's stop going to church. Let's start growing in church. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this being challenge. And Lord, we've got another seven days to just really read through the material and um, kind of figure out, Lord, how this applies to us. We pray that these key habits, these keystone habits of Jesus will become so instrumental in our lives, Lord, that as we're making these small decisions, uh, adopting these small habits into our lives, that we're seeing ourselves change, that we're being transformed day by day, more and more into the image of Jesus, that we are not just simply believers, but that we are disciples of Jesus Christ who are making more disciples and more disciples and more disciples. God, may we be your church, a strong church, a church that is flourishing, growing, maturing, Do that in our midst, God. We're begging you to to revive us, to awaken your church here in our midst. We need your spirit. We need your Holy Spirit to do the things in us that we simply can't do on our own. We need to be shocked out of our complacency and our apathy so that, oh God, we might become everything you desire for us. Help us not to forsake our first love, but to burn brightly for you, Jesus. We thank you. It's in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus we pray all these things. Amen. Hey everyone, and again, we just want to welcome you to Faith. My name is Alyssa, and here is everything that's happening inside Faith Church right now. If you're new with us today, we want to welcome you to Faith. We're so glad that you're here, and to celebrate, we would love to pledge a $5 donation to a charity of your choice out of our pockets. All you have to do is text Faith Church to 97000 and follow the steps as a guest. Once you do that, we'll send you an email asking which charity you wish us to donate to. And that's it. So again, you can take out your phone right now and text Faith Church to 97000 and we'll pledge that $5 donation today. If you would like to partner with us today and give, the best way to do that is to text that same word, Faith Church, to 97000, and you'll get a text reply back that'll direct you from there. Our whole mission here at Faith is to love and lead people into a growing faith in Jesus, and it's because of your generosity that we're able to do that. So thank you for giving. If you're new with us, or if you've been coming for a few months, you might have some questions. What do you believe? What's there for my family? How can I become a member? Our next steps classes are designed for anyone who is new to Faith Church or who wants to get more involved. In these three classes, you'll discover where you belong, what we believe, and who God is inviting you to become. Classes will be held on Zoom starting May 16th at 7.30 p.m. To sign up, text Faith Church to 97000 and follow the steps. We would love to help you take a next step in your journey here at Faith, so we hope to see you in our next step classes. For all signups and next steps, text Faith Church to 97000 or visit faithauburn.info, and we'd love to help you get connected this season.
Everything is a sacrifice Use me how you want to, God Have your throne within my heart I hear you I hear you That song we just sang speaks of us surrendering ourselves to Jesus. The lyrics in that first verse say, narrow as the road may seem, I'll follow where your spirit leads. The greatest example of that kind of surrender happens, happened 2000 years ago when Jesus surrendered his life on the cross. On that same night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas, he sat with his disciples to celebrate the Passover meal. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take a knee right now. In the same way, he also took the cup and after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and drink right now. Right now we're gonna continue singing Let's sing together right now. Well, hello everybody. We're gonna worship God together today. Let's sing this song out. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. You see a mountain move And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me yeah. There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you So when I fight, come on So when I fight I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me, yeah? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. And all I see on the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. Oh, 
torches, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. Come on, let's sing it out. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. The battle belongs to you, yeah. And oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. Today we conclude the Being Challenge, but don't let it stop here. We believe that there is a next step for you to take today to further connect with God and with others. First of all, if you're new with us, we invite you to fill out a Connect card and let us know that you're new. You can do that by texting Faith Church to 97000 and following the steps as a guest. Another simple next step is to share this service to your own Facebook page. We believe that God has surrounded you with the people who need the good news of Jesus. Sharing the service is a great way to start that conversation. Another way to further connect is by attending one of our in-person services, which happen on Sundays at 9 or 11 a.m. Just be sure to pre-register to let us know that you're coming. For all signups and next steps, text Faith Church to 97000 or visit faithauburn.info and we'd love to help you get connected in this season. Thanks again for watching and we hope you have a great week.